Prime Minister Netanyahu should not be invited to speak before Congress, say Israel's angry elites. I'll tell you why they're so upset and taking their fight to the New York Times, coming up on In Focus. On Wednesday, June 26, the New York Times ran a wild op-ed column called Netanyahu Does Not Speak for Us, should Congress Should Disinvite Him. It was published under the bylines of four of Israel's top former officials. Actually, one is currently a uh, senior official. So I'll just give you uh, the lineup of the people who signed this uh, very angry op-ed to the New York Times. They include David Harrell, who's the president of Israel's Academy of Sciences and Humanities, Tamir Pardo, the former director of Mossad. Talia Sassone, she's a former director of a special tasks department at the Israel's attorney general's office or state attorney's office. And Ehud Barak, the peripatetic former failed prime minister of Israel and defense minister of Israel, who has billions of dollars in personal financial interests uh, in the United States tied to senior officials in the Biden administration. But that's for another time anyway. So you have these four senior officials uh, for, or former four senior officials who go to the pages of the New York Times and they argue that Congress was wrong to invite Prime Minister Netanyahu to address the joint session of Congress for the fourth time uh, on uh, July 24th. Um, and they set out a bunch of reasons why they shouldn't. And normally I wouldn't care what any of these people have to say, but since they're taking it to the New York Times and it's being discussed in the U.S. media as if they represent somebody, I wanted to just walk you through what the column that they wrote says and why they're saying it and whether there's any truth behind what they said, because I think it's important to set the record straight. So the first thing that they say is that Netanyahu does not uh, speak for the people of Israel and the state of Israel. They say here, Netan they say Congress has made a terrible mistake by inviting Netanyahu to speak there because Mr. Netanyahu's appearance in Washington will not represent the state of Israel and its citizens, and it will reward his scandalous and destructive con conduct towards our country. So what does that really mean, that he doesn't represent Israel? Well, let's go to the polls. Does he or does he not represent Israel? On Wednesday, Channel 14 uh, published the latest, the most recent poll of where Israeli voters uh, stand on our leadership. Um, it was uh, conducted by direct polls that also worked with us here at JNS, and we'll be starting to put out polls of our own very quickly, I mean very soon. But uh, what I was going to say, but, but what the polls showed was that far from what these four former senior officials or, or one, one senior person and three former senior people say, Netanyahu absolutely represents the people of Israel, and he remains the most popular leader in Israel. I'm just going to give you some of the data. So in head-to-head -head polls against Benny Gantz, who's considered his principal contender uh, or competitor for uh, the, the role of prime minister, in head-to-head -head, uh, polls, Netanyahu is leading Gantz 44 to 33 points, and he's leading the head of the opposition, Yesh Atid party leader and former acting prime minister, Yair Lapid, 46 points to 34 points. So in both cases, he's leading his principal competitors by 12 points, Okay. That's, that's very significant. And then when you look at, in Israel, we have a parliamentary democracy and people vote for parties. It's indirect representation. You vote for a party list. And that's what determines who gets to form a coalition. So in the current coalition, you have a coalition of Likud and right and religious uh, parties that it comprises a 64-vote majority in the 120-seat Knesset. And uh, the latest poll shows that that same block remains the largest block. It has 58 seats. The opposition has only 52 seats. So that's Gantz and Gallant and, and I mean, Gantz and, uh, and Lapid and other uh, parties on the left. Um, they have 52 uh, seats. But of those 52 seats, 14 belong to Avigdor Lieberman's Yisrael Beitenu party. And Yisrael Beitenu is actually in the opposition, but it's not a left-wing party. It's actually very far to the right. In fact, 80% of Israel Beitenu's voters view themselves as on the right, not on the center right, but on the right. So you have 80% of its voters 
are on the right, which means that the likelihood that that party is going to be part of a left-wing coalition is very small. So if you take uh, that party out, those 14 of the left, and the left only has 38 mandates in a, in a hypothetical Knesset election uh, that could take place tomorrow if these people have their druthers. So that's very important. Um, the other thing is um, that they say, trying to present themselves as a representative sample of Israelis, they say, we come from a variety of areas of Israeli society, science, technology, politics, defense, law, and culture. It's true that they come from various areas at the elite top of Israeli society, but what they fail to mention is that they all are members of a very small political camp. They're all on the very far left. So according to that same poll, which, is, which are numbers that are also borne out in other polls, uh, the party that would represent their positions, which is the Labor Party or a combined uh, uh, run of Labor and Merit's party, the two far left parties, those parties together are polling eight seats under former Deputy Chief of Staff of the Army, Yair Golan. So eight seats out of 120 is six and two thirds of percent of Israelis. So in other words, only only 93.4 percent of Israelis disagree with everything that they have to say. So they claim that they're representing Israel because they come from different fields, but they do not represent 93.4 percent of Israelis who would not vote for the far left party that rep represents all of the people who signed on to this uh, uh, letter to the or op-ed in the New York Times. So th and that's on a good day. So what is it that these people are saying? Why is it that they're saying that Netanyahu doesn't represent them? And I think that this is the purpose of me talking to you today. What they say here is that Netanyahu is a terrible leader and he shouldn't and he should be ostracized by the US Congress and he should be disinvited from Congress because he is not accepting a ceasefire deal with Hamas that would leave Hamas in power and they believe get the hostages out of Gaza. And first of all, it's not true that Netanyahu has opposed a ceasefire deal that would give us some of the hostages. What he opposes is an end to the war, agreeing at the outset uh, that this would be the end of the war. And he said, no, we have our war goals and we're not going to abandon them. The war's goals are to oust Hamas from power as a political regime, destroy it as a political force in Gaza, destroy it as a military force in Gaza, and prevent it from ever receding in Gaza, re rebuilding itself in Gaza. So that's the goals of the government. And by the way, they were agreed to by the left. They're massively supported by the overwhelming majority of Israelis who support all of those goals and who oppose a ceasefire if it comes without having achieved all three of those goals, return of all of the hostages home as well is, is, the, is actually the third goal. So it's destroying Hamas as a regime and as a military organization. It's the return of all of the 120 hostages being held in Gaza that is dead and alive home to Israel and preventing Hamas from ever rebuilding its power in Gaza. Those are the three goals of the war and they are all fully supported by the overwhelming majority of Israelis. That's the vast majority of the 93.4% of Israelis who don't agree with the four authors of this New York Times article calling for the United States to ostracize Netanyahu because he doesn't represent Israel. Okay? And then they make a list of what their demands are and what they think that Netanyahu should be doing in order to be worthy of, uh, of being invited or, or at least um, not being hated by them. So he says, at, they say, at the very least, an invitation to address Congress should have been contention, should have been contingent on resolving these two issues, which are freeing the hostages and coming up with a plan to end the war. And that's what they want. They want a plan to end the war that the, along the lines of precisely the plan that the Biden administration set, has set out, which is bringing in some sort of a reformed Palestinian authority that together with Arab militaries would take control over Gaza, meaning Hamas would remain in control of Gaza. Why? Because none of these forces will ever fight Hamas so that it's like Lebanon. You know, let's bring in UN forces. Let's bring in multinational forces. Let's bring in Arab forces that are going to protect Israel from Hezbollah. And of course, none of them do. The Lebanese armed forces, let's have that at the border. But Lebanese armed forces is controlled by Hezbollah. UNIFEL is controlled by Hezbollah. 
any foreign force that would come in would be controlled by Hezbollah because Hezbollah is always going to be stronger than any force that comes in from the outside. Same thing with Hamas. If anybody that comes into Gaza other than the IDF is going to enable Hamas to rebuild its power. There's no two ways about it. We've seen this time and time again, and it, it just won't happen. So that's Biden's idea because Biden's strategy is to de-escalate, to de-escalate no matter what. That's what he wants. He doesn't want anything else, and he's willing to pay with as much Israeli coinage as he needs in order to de-escalate. So his plan is a crock. And the other thing that it causes is it causes Israel to remain in a straitjacket that 80 percent of Israelis don't want to be in ever again, which is moving us towards the establishment of a Palestinian state. The one thing that the overwhelming majority of Israelis agree on is that the lesson of October 7th is that we absolutely can never have a Palestinian state, not in Judea and Samaria, not in Gaza, not anywhere, in our midst. If they want to have it, you know, in Michigan, they can have a Palestinian state in Michigan, but they can't have a Palestinian state in the land of Israel west of the Jordan River. It's just not going to happen, not in our lifetimes, after what happened. So, you know, this is trying to corral Israel into this two-state solution. And that's what they're demanding. And, of course, they want early elections. And it's not that they want early elections because they think they'll win. They know that they'll lose elections if they're held. They want early elections because that will paralyze the government and make it impossible to continue to prosecute the war, meaning that the call for early elections is actually a cause call for Israel to capitulate to Hamas in, in Gaza and to lose the war. So what they want is capitulation. They want Biden's plan because Biden's plan will lead to capitulation. And why do they want capitulation? Because they've become obsessed, obsessed. And we've seen this over and over and over again, not just over the past two years since the Netanyahu government came into office um, or one and a half years. I can't even remember anymore. It feels like a million years ago, but they came into office in December of 2022. So less than two years. And they have been at it, trying to oust him from politics, actually since the 1990s. They have been in this obsession about Netanyahu, really since he returned to Israel after serving as UN ambassador in the 1980s. He has always been this red, red, uh, red uh, flag for them. And they just want to get rid of him. And so they think that if we lose the war, as they, as they set out, the Netanyahu is going to be gotten rid of. That's why they want it. And what happens afterwards, they believe that they can handle any successor in a way that they haven't been able to handle Netanyahu, which is why it's imperative from their perspective that he be ousted from power, whatever the cost, including strategic defeat and a war for Israel's national survival. They're Samson and, they want, and, and the people of Israel are the Philistines and they want to bring the house down if they can't lead it. And so that's what they're calling for now, because they want to get rid of Netanyahu. And they're taking their, their, their thing to the New York Times, and they're working with the Biden administration to achieve that goal, because the Biden, wants, Biden administration wants Netanyahu out in order to get quiet and apply it and a compliant Israeli government ahead of the elections. And then afterwards, if Biden gets reelected, and the left wants him out because they hate him and they think that he's the root of all evil, they're, he's the root of all of their problems. But what they don't realize is that 93.4% of Israelis are the root of their problem. That is, they can't sell their problem to the pe their, their policies to the people. So they want to do away with democracy. That's the other thing. So they keep saying over and over again that any move by the government to undermine the privilege of Israel's unelected elites, like these four people and all of the people that are siding with them, whether it's in the Supreme Court or the media, or the senior government service or the general staff of the IDF, they are worried that, you know, that, that this government is going to follow through with their earlier plan of legal reform, of military reform, that will undermine or, or, or diminish the power of Israel's, uh, of Israel's elites, of which they are proud members and leaders. And so they want... They want to oust the government in order to avoid reform. And here, I think, is the point that really has to be made here. Um, the thing that they're most afraid of right now is the implications of this war. And, and there's one last thing here where they say that Netanyahu has to be ousted because he refuse he, here because the man who will address Congress next month has failed to assume responsibility for the blunders that allowed Hamas 
The Hamas assault initially blaming security chiefs and quickly backtracking and has yet to announce the establishment of a direly needed state commission of inquiry headed by a Supreme Court judge to look into this fiasco. So here, just to make a long story short, the whole idea of a commission of inquiry, an official uh, commission of inquiry, the reason why they're so keen for it is because it will be led by a Supreme Court justice. And the Supreme Court, as we've already seen over the past two years of their internal revolt, they view rightly as the gatekeeper for their power in Israel. And if an official commission of inquiry is formed to look into the blunders, then it's going to let off the whole military general staff that failed, that led directly to the fiasco that we suffered on October 7th, that gutted the military, that doesn't understand basic military science, that believed that we could base our defense strategy and doctrine on, uh, on high tech and not boots on the ground. They gutted the ground forces and they built, they spent billions and billions and billions of shekels on these high tech systems that all failed on October 7th. So they don't want them to have to pay the piper. They want to push all of the blame. They want to scapegoat Netanyahu for what happened on October 7th, even though he had nothing to do with it, except for the fact that he didn't fire the security chiefs before October 7th. So his failure was a failure of omission, that he didn't deal with the security leadership, which is so completely incompetent. And they want to let that security leadership off the hook and put the hook on Netanyahu's neck and hang him from it. And they believe that an official commission of inquiry led by a Supreme Court judge, because of the political position and the privileged position of the Supreme Court in Israeli society, is going to do the trick for them. That's why they're demanding that he do this. And why is this so imperative to them? Why are they so keen to end the war, to have a commission of inquiry that's led by a Supreme Court judge, and even have elections despite the fact that they'll lose them? And the answer to that is because the thing that happened on October 7th and since is that every single aspect of the, of the far left elite that has been running Israel into the ground for the past generation at a minimum has been exposed as a failure. And we can just go through the different you know, walks of life that these four very, very, uh, very, very similar uh, former senior officials uh, are members of. So let's just look. And, and we're talking about, you know, the key institutions in Israeli society. So if you look, science and humanities, right, because uh, uh, David Harrell is the head of the Academy for Sciences and Humanities in Israel, right? So if you look at science and humanities, so just look at science for a second. Again, since uh, Ehud Barak, who's a signatory on this, was prime minister, and even before that, when he was chief of the general staff of the army in the 1990s, he kept talking about turning the army into a, a small, professional, high-tech military force. And his doctrine of a, of a, of a small, uh, tech-savvy military was the guiding doctrine of all of the generals that followed after him. They had this idea that at the end of the Cold War, the, that uh, major, uh, major conventional military contests were over and that all we were going to have now are these little asymmetric things that could be handled, you know, with joysticks. And so that collapsed completely on October 7th. That totally collapsed. I mean, what we're seeing now is that we are very much in the age of conventional warfare with high tech, with drones, with uh, unmet, with uh, with uh, uh, anti-rocket missiles, with all of this, but it's not, we're very much in the age of conventional warfare. So that whole high tech is going to be our savior, that this is some sort of an elixir that's gonna fix all the problems, that was destroyed. Humanities, so the humanities have been taken over by post-nationalist, post-Zionist progressive dogma, and that completely failed, totally failed on October 7th and since. Everything about the progressive worldview has failed and is now betraying Israel where you see all these leftists, you know, calling for Israel to be annihilated, walking lock, lockstep with Islamists, calling for Israel to be annihilated. So the whole idea that progressivism was something that was going to join Israel to a global uh, community is totally wrong, 
totally incorrect. We are very much in the age of nationalism. We are in the age of patriotism. And the whole concept of progressivism has been vomited out by the vast majority of Israelis since October 7th, including the people who adhered to it on October 6th. And so that's just the science and the humanities. And then you go to military. Again, there's this, I talked about this in my podcast, my very important conversation with Amiad Cohen from the Herut Center, which uh, you should all check out. Um, you know, we, we've had generations of general staffs now going back for 20 years, insisting that there's no military solution to asymmetrical warfare, to terrorist attacks on Israel, to terror armies, that there's only a political solution, meaning appeasement, meaning that they don't believe that they're supposed to fight to victory because there's no such thing as victory in their postmodern gobbledygook that they take as military science. And we saw precisely the insanity of that view now with Hamas's invasion. Here we thought we had reached so that they were deterred. They're not deterred. They're a genocidal terror army and terror force and, and doctrine, Islamic jihadist doctrine. These are all the things that Hamas is. And you don't defeat that. They say you can't defeat an idea. Well, you actually can defeat an idea by bashing it into, into sand. And that's what is being done today in Gaza. That what has to continue to be done in Gaza and anywhere else because these people mean what they say and they believe what they believe and they're always going to try to advance their beliefs because all of us do. And so in that sense, we're similar. We all believe in what we believe and we live our lives by our beliefs. Their beliefs are that they want to sanctify death and they want to annihilate all of the Jews. So no, there's only a military solution to military problems. There's no diplomatic solution to military problems. And then the law. What's going on in the ICC? What's going on in the International Court of Justice where Israel's being uh, tried for genocide? And the ICC where they're proclaiming that our political leaders and in, and in time our military war fighters are war criminals. What's happened is the total collapse of the legal fraternity's concept that their embrace of, of progressive legal nostrums that give extrajudicial power to our legal fraternity, that that was going to somehow or another protect Israel from the international lynch mob that uses lawfare to deny Israel's right to exist. And what we're seeing now is that having these post-nationalist, post-Zionist justices lord over Israel and go over with a fine-tooth comb every single action that the IDF takes in every single military confrontation with our enemies, whether it's in Judea and Samaria or Gaza or Lebanon or anywhere else, has made no difference. If we had the most hawkish uh, uh, nationalist justices in control of the Supreme Court, or now we have these post-nationalists straight, ja straight jacketing the IDF and our government on every turn, right? It doesn't make any difference to the international community. All of us are war criminals in the eyes of people like Kareem Khan, the chief prosecutor at the ICC. So we're talking about something that has been proven completely wrong Every single aspect of what they've been telling Israelis has been exposed as a total lie. And they're afraid of a reckoning. They're afraid of a reckoning. So what they're doing is they're going outside of Israel. They're working with a foreign government, with a hostile U.S. administration, the Biden administration, to try to discredit the widely supported prime ministers whose war goals are supported by an even larger percentage of Israelis. So if you take the 58, vo the 58 seats that the current coalition now has in the polls, and you add to that another 14 seats from Yvette Lieberman's, you're ending up with a coalition of 72 mandates, right, of people who want to win this war. Some of them might not like Netanyahu. You have 14 votes for a party that's in the opposition, according to the polls, but you have 72 out of 120 mandates in the Knesset going right now in polls to to parties that seek total victory in this war. And here you have these elites who represent, on a good day, 6.6% of Israelis, saying to the American people that the Prime Minister of Israel does not speak for the state of Israel or for the people of Israel. And he absolutely does. The people who don't speak for anybody but themselves are the people who are now being published in the New York Times. There's nothing new here. I mean, find the last time that a right-wing Israeli who represents the views of the majority of Israelis, was allowed to have an op-ed published in the New York Times. I don't remember the last time that that happened. So 
yes, they're going to their in-house journal in New York, but they've been presenting themselves for a long time to the American people as the authentic voice of the Israeli people when they represent almost nobody in this country. And they're doing it now at a time when Israel is waging a war for our national survival against Iran and its proxies to undermine the legitimacy of the prime minister of Israel. And I just think it's very important for us all to recognize what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a privileged elite that has blocked entry from 93% of Israelis to the paths of power, to the halls of power in Israel, in our bureaucracy, in our media, in, in our academia. And they've been doing it forever. And they're about to get handed their pink slips by the people of Israel because a revolutionary change has happened since October 7th among the Israeli people. And it may not manifest itself in the next elections, but it's manifesting itself everywhere in Israel. Do you know what percentage of the people who have been killed in battle are from the 93%? 80%. 80% are national religious and religiously traditional. Sephardic, the second Israel that it's called here. 80%. And 80% of the army comes from those categories as well. So, you know, who do they represent in Israel? No one. But they get, the, they get the stage, they get the prestigious stages, they get prestigious titles. We have to keep our eye on the ball. The reason that they hate Netanyahu is that Netanyahu speaks English better than they do. He understands geopolitics better than they do. He understands economics better than they do. He understands many things better than they do. And what he does that they don't do is he represents the 93% of Israelis that they're not members of and that they have contempt for. And that's why they hate him more than anything else. So it's very important as we move towards J July 24th and we see more and more panic among Democrats of the fissures in the party that are going to be exposed by who shows up in the joint session and who boycotts him. Over Israel and over the fate of the Western world, we're going to see more and more hysterical statements made by Israeli leftists who are working with the Biden administration and by anonymous Democrats in and out of the administration demanding that he be disinvited. We have to think about that. Why are they opposing it so much? They're opposing it because they fear it. Anyway, those are my thoughts for today, and I'll share more thoughts with you next week. Have a great weekend.